From a young age, Mike Rolls has been a man on the move. Well, growing up in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, how can you not be active? My life revolved around sport, and that was probably largely led by my old man who uh, was a good cricketer, and then I ended up playing cricket and footy and just about anything I could. But it was during an end-of-season footy trip in 2001 that Mike nearly lost his life. We went across to Hobart in Tasmania, but somewhere along the line on that football trip, I uh, caught the, the really nasty and, uh, and sinister meningococcal disease, uh, which basically left me in a coma and then cost me initially my right leg below my knee, most of my left leg, a couple of fingers. It's fair to say, as an 18-year-old kid that's physically active, sports mad, to find yourself in an amputee ward, you know, trying to pick up the pieces and learn how to walk again was pretty tough. Adjusting to life with an artificial right leg took enormous strength. But as time went on, Mike found that his remaining left leg was causing him more troubles than the prosthesis. So I was left with a leg that would never heal. It was cut right way through sort of the arch um, in the foot and it would break down all the time. And I would always make excuses and say, oh, it, is, you know, it could always be worse. And I think deep down I was just avoiding, you know, facing up to the situation that I was in. I think push came to shove where I, I ended up getting an infection in the bone and uh, they said to me, hey, listen, I think one thing you should probably consider is other options because this is going to heal itself. So I made a really tough decision and I decided to get rid of that leg uh, that was holding me back. It wasn't an easy one. I wanted to bail plenty of times in the lead up to that operation, but eventually I underwent the surgery, had my, my leg taken away below the knee. And about five and a half weeks later, after it healed, I was able to stand up for the first time in eight or nine years, pain-free, which was a pretty amazing experience. And I think that opened the doors uh, to a lot of great opportunities. Hey, slow down. <laughs> now that I didn't have a wound that I was dealing with and a leg that I was limping on all the time, yeah. I could then look at, well, what else can I do? You know, and one of the things that I wanted to do for plenty of time was to try and run again. You know, what a great experience to try and run again. So I got fitted with prosthetics that were specifically designed for running. Um, and then it was about, about accessing water. So I, I, I had a prototype made for prosthetics that allowed me to access the water. It sounds crazy when people say, now, you know, Mike, you've got one leg left and now you're going to chop that off. And I'm like, yeah, I am. It's going to be fantastic. And that's kind of how I felt, but they all thought I was crazy. But it was absolutely the best decision I, I made. And I made it, I've got to be honest with you, I made it based on the, the amazing prosthetic technology that was available. And I thought about that leg that I was, you know, dragging along with me for so long. And my regret now, I look back and I can honestly say my biggest regret was, was not doing it sooner. Mike's radical decision allowed him to return to the active lifestyle he's always cherished. But the high-tech legs he gets around on today are a far cry from what was on offer just a couple of decades ago. When I first started in prosthetics, I was actually kind of shocked and disappointed at the, at the sophistication of the technology that we were using. It was really basic. Royal Melbourne Hospital Head of Prosthetics Mark Graff says that many of the key developments in his field have been the result of historic spikes in public awareness. There are times when there are bursts of interest and funding and research that are due to things like war, because you know, obviously in a war there's loss of limb and there is that motivation to look after soldiers. But in countries like Australia and the US and the UK, 80% of the cause of amputation is actually vascular issues and generally on a background of diabetes. A recent increase in demand alongside rapid advancements in computer science has ushered in a new golden age in prosthetic technology in which Mark and his colleagues can customise their creations to suit individual needs and lifestyles. The first thing we have to do is talk to them, find out how they would like to use the prosthesis, where they would like to use the prosthesis, in what environment. Do they want to go to the beach? Do they live in far north Queensland? I think it matters, like, how close to us do they live? We've had lots of changes in the materials that we use. We're using a lot more glass and carbon fibre, titanium, aluminium, plastics are in the design. And the, the purpose there is to make them light and strong. When I fatigue on this side, I do, my, my foot does tend to go in. On One of many Australians to benefit from these enormous steps forward is Melissa Noonan, founder of the amputee support organisation Limbs for Life. I lost my leg in a trauma accident 2003. 
I went to board a train and the doors closed and I went between the train and the platform. And prosthetics back in those days, we're talking 20 years ago, were really basic, very mechanical, quite clunky. I remember thinking at the time, you know, how am I going to get used to this? So this prosthesis was my second leg. It's the, the leg that I was discharged from rehab on. The, the foot is very stiff. It has no movement in the ankle or the foot whatsoever. The knee has no stability in it. In fact, it is like a door hinge, it just collapses. So you can imagine that if you're walking and you trip, there's no resistance there. Nothing is going to save you. You're actually going to hit the deck. With the old mechanical devices, I was probably burning 65% more energy just using and driving that leg. And that combined with the, the lack of feeling stable and the fact that it could collapse under me, you're always sort of a little bit on edge that that could happen. So you're mentally exhausted from the level of concentration and it's actually really hard to have a conversation where your attention is fully focused on what you're trying to say, if that makes sense. Because well, if you're standing, you're always wanting to make sure that that weight alignment is exactly the same and stable the whole time. And one more time up and back for me, Mel. When you get down to this end, would you mind taking a seat in the chair for me, please? Yep. After four taxing years walking with a basic mechanical knee, in 2008, Melissa participated in a trial for a device that would revolutionise the world of prosthetics, a computerised hydraulic knee. I remember wearing it for the first full day and just thinking, you know, I'm not exhausted anymore. Like, I'm not mentally. I can have a conversation with someone after 8 o'clock at night and actually be engaged in that discussion. And stand back up for me again, please. I have what's called an X3 Genium now. And this prosthesis is, it's even more advanced than the last one. So my last one, I used to have to charge it every night. Um, this one, I probably get about six days without charging it. I can actually, on my mobile phone, program the resistance. I can change walking speed so I can go fast and go slow. This has actually got a sensor built into the ankle, so it knows if I'm going to fall and their leg locks, so it basically prevents falls. Ever since I've had this, I've never had a fall. Today, amputees across Australia are living more independent and active lives than ever before. But for those who lose a limb later in life, these game-changing devices often remain out of reach. Funding for people under 65 is covered by the National Disability Insurance Scheme. But a lot of the most vulnerable people in our country have difficulty accessing funding. You know, it can lead to long-term social isolation. They don't feel confident going out. And the older we get, the more fragile and frail we become. So, you know, I struggle to imagine what someone who was maybe, you know, 70 or 75 walking on my very first prosthesis and try and feel confident out in the community would, would be really, really difficult. I think that anyone that acquires a disability or is even born with a disability faces a whole host of barriers that they can't change and they've just got to deal with them. But there's certainly barriers, I believe, that are movable. And I think that technology and access to technology is absolutely something that is a removable barrier. It's hard enough living life with a disability. If we can make people's lives easier using technology, regardless of age, circumstance, whatever situation they're in, then I think we should absolutely do that.